Raghu Marcus, it is a pleasure, an honor. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Happy to be here, Stuart. Mm -hmm. How are you? How are you doing in Ojai for starters? It feels rude not to check in with how you're doing in California. Well, California's not so good with COVID, obviously. It's an epicenter. Uh, Ojai's a little bit more of an o oasis. Of course, now there's a the threat of uh, fires from big winds and high temperatures. California, what, you know, what are you going to do? You pay for being out here one way or the other. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, yeah it's, cool. it's home away from home for us. So it's been really heartbreaking to see uh, the events unfolding in the U.S. and especially, yeah, um, particular parts. But yeah, California's had an interesting year, huh? Yeah, well, the mm -hmm. whole country. I mean, really. Yeah, that's know. right. Where are you, Stuart? In Western Australia. This is home. Uh-huh. So this you have like, also some thinking about fires or their last year was horrible. So. Yeah, last year, especially on the East Coast, they had it real, real challenging, which then led into COVID. But on the West Coast, um, yeah, fires are a, a yearly thing. But yeah, we had one yesterday, but they're, they're under control, oh, really? apparently. But there's right a lot now? of like, mm. yeah, there's a lot of controlled burning, like, because we're just so used to used to it here. But mm. um, now, apart from well, that, it's been a little bit of a, a bubble, an isolated bubble away from the rest of the world. That's been quite interesting being here and observing our brothers and sisters around the whole world, you know, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's, uh, as uh, I've been saying on my mind rolling podcast, I found something that the ancient Chinese used as an aphorism for these times, and it's called dangerous opportunity. I heard you talk about that. I was going to bring that up. I'd love to. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I found that quite interesting. I hadn't heard that term before. And um, yeah, me neither. It, it, do, it does ring true, and it feels very potent. And so what, what, what are you feeling from that dangerous opportunity? Well, you know, there's so many levels of it, the interconnectivity of everybody you know, start with COVID, uh, you know, include a little bit of the uh, polarization with nationalism. Um, and here in America, nationalism, individualism, uh, you know, opposing liberalism, basically. Uh, so you add a little of that mix into it. The racial justice thing, which just exploded here with George Floyd uh, a year ago, or a little less and you have uh, quite a mixture, uh, obviously with the pandemic, people are, are uh, you know, spending more time with themselves. So all of it is a recipe for uh, review of, not to mention, I haven't even, the environmental issues, which are huge, obviously, can, totally connected to the, to the virus. So the kind of waking up that seems to be going on on some level, obviously not throughout society, uh, is, is an opportunity. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to awaken and take some action on an individual basis and some responsibility. Uh, the dangerous part is this is a, a really dangerous virus. They're even saying this one, yeah, it's it seems bad, but it could be way worse. You know, another, uh, as the uh, ice melts and then all this stuff gets released. Another, I mean, you know, you can go on into an apocalypse uh, mind easily, right? But so there is danger involved. Uh, to me, more of the danger involved is um, it's around the the reality of this polarization. I'm not so sure what's going on in Australia, but I know this is going on in Europe, and I know it's, of course, going on here. Uh, but I, it's, I think it's pretty endemic. And that, uh, to me, is the most dangerous part, that we can't cross this bridge between us. Between oh, yeah, it's going side. on here as well. It's going on here yeah. as well. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, Australia feels like a... Um, like a mini mini America in a way like there, there's 
big reflections that go on here. A lot of the mm. polarities in terms of all the various uh, tribalism and conspiracy theories that uh, that's all going on here as well. And it's been very interesting, even, even within the kind of spiritual yoga and wellness community, it's infiltrated that like big time. And that's been interesting to observe this kind of tribalism, yeah. even within the spiritual community. And um, yeah, very, very strange yeah. to observe. And I've had even dear friends that I thought were fully on the same page, like fully seeing things very similar to one another. And then all of a sudden, um, something, something got them or I mean, I, I try to keep my lens open as well, like, uh, and try, try to try to listen, you know, and not be not not feed that trap of polarization, which my instant reaction is to like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you got sucked into that. But then I try, I try to observe my righteousness and like not, um, not feed that too much. But it's, it's, it's tricky right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we, uh, of course, we're all considering this and talking about it and from that level all the way to the kind of Trump polarization, Trump people. Um, so we found uh, a, a, uh, a conversation between Ram Dass and a man named Joseph Goldstein, who's one of the three main teachers who brought Vipassana meditation back to the West. And Ramdas actually was reading a letter. Uh, this is available. You just got to search around uh, the social media, Ramdas, Instagram, and all that stuff. Um, he read a letter from someone saying exactly what it is, reflecting what we're, you and I are talking about. Now, what do we do? I mean, I, you know, I can't get through this. It's terrible. I can't get through this polarization. And Joseph then said, you know, it's, it's, I'm just remembering like around 9-11, all those years ago, he said, I was doing um, a retreat, a meditation retreat. And then there was Q&A at the end and people were one after the other talking about you, you're saying do meta loving kindness meditation. Uh, may all beings be happy. Well, I don't want those MFs to be happy. I can't say that. It's complete bullshit. And he considered it and went, yeah, no, I, obviously we can all hear that issue. So he said, well, why don't you change it out and say, may all beings be free of hatred. Right. That was an opening. We all want all beings to be free mm -hmm. of hatred. So we have to just find one place that we can put one foot in front of the other to start making the change inside ourselves so that something can happen. Totally. Now, speaking of Joseph Goldstein, which uh, I revere him so much, he's a great teacher, you, uh, which brings me both. to, yeah, and I just love how the Love Serve Remember Foundation, the Ram Dass community, that whole crew the, the balance between Buddhism and bhakti and I just love it. And my wife and I, it's, it, it's, it's changed our life. You know, it, it, the combination of the psychedelic experiences we've had, the, the deep yoga experiences we've had. And, and of course these immersions with, and retreats and time spent with these incredible teachers that have taken Buddhism so deep and, and bhakti so deep. And there's possibly because, but uh, I feel, and there's this humility and like everyone's super like, like kind of like little kids as well. So all these master teachers, yet everyone's very grounded and real and, and all that kind of spiritual materialism shit that's so common. Haven't felt that much when I'm around a lot of this uh, community. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. thing, and um, I'd love to hear I your agree. journey of cause a lot of um, a lot of people that have been showing up to my yoga classes that and that listen to this are young men in their early twenties that are going deep right now, 
but they're also, they, I mean, it's an interesting time with all the information available, all the great teachings available. Well, so many of them, it can be really confusing. All the plant medicine so available, all like, it's an interesting time, not to mention all the conspiracy theories that we just talked about as well. And I know, how old were you when you first met Ramdas and started, you started getting influenced by that and changed by early, that? early 20s, 23 right. or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So same as the people that are coming to see you. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's kind of in terms of there's so much out there. What do you what do you pick and all of that? It's not like that. It's I would be telling them um, it's about trust. And they're coming to you because they trust you. I don't care on what level. Maybe you, you know, you're the best yoga teacher in town or just somebody hung with you for a moment and you really least listen to them and, the, you know, mm -hmm. something happened that made them gravitate to, well, maybe I'll come and do some stuff with him. So that's what happened to me. I met Ram Dass and um, he did that by just enveloping me in this unconditionality. Uh, no Ram Dass, no Richard Alpert. He was just totally there in the moment for me, me, you know, and I had never encountered anything like that before. So uh, I had trust. And that trust led me to India when he went back, you know, a year later or whatever. And I went over there and that's uh, the rest of it is completely. Um, it's a it's a travelogue based on that initial trust. Everything happened from that. So to me, anybody who's going to see you has that. And then you're going to sit around and talk about Joseph Goldstein a, a minute, maybe do a little kirtan or whatever. And you're introducing and this what is dear to you to whoever is around because you just want to share it. It's the same thing Ram Dass did. You know, and all of the, I mean, I can't tell you how many people are still reading Be Here Now and taking acid and whoops. Oh, new perspective. What's mm -hmm. this? You know, and following that now. But again, it's all around trust. And uh, if they're coming and you're you're sharing what it is you love, which is you're telling me, you know, around bhakti and Buddhism, which is that's everything we were given from Neem Karoli Baba. Was is that? Mm -hmm. So uh, Joseph and Sharon and Jack, the way they are family to us, is, it, it is. I mean, we do all these retreats in Maui, or had done until Ram Dass left. Although we're hoping we'll get get another one in at the end of the year mm -hmm. in Maui. Um, that's what it was about. That always had that the discriminating wisdom that really Buddhism represents and really an understanding of reality uh, to give you a little per mind perspective. And then the, the bhakti is, is the devotion part is, um, is the wide opening, you know, from the center of your chest, it's that loving awareness that Ram Dass talks about. And the common combination of those two things is, is really powerful. Definitely. Yeah, it's a potent combination for sure. Um, back to dangerous opportunity. I think it'd be really yeah. nice to just keep diving into that and 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 of course thinking of Ramdas and how like of course for so long for so much of his life he was a great teacher, and then like post stroke how he how he managed that and navigated what twenty twenty two years was it post stroke something. Something and they, like uh, and I mean, cause we through grace, like really got to spend a lot of time with him on Maui and it, it didn't feel like he was in discomfort in pain. He was so joyful and youthful and light and fun. And of course, Ramdas yet what a teaching, just the way he applied these practices to, to that, suffering in which uh, i remember watching fierce grace and him talking about the initial the initial struggle 
the initial struggle mm. of the stroke. Yeah, and then, that was real too. Yeah, and then it really waking him up to to be such a what a legacy, what a teaching. And um, how do you find in your own life, like working with the current challenges, challenges within your, your own life, this combination of bhakti and Buddhism, what's your journey like in being so close to Ramdas for so much of his life and being a teacher yourself as well and having now a lot of attention? Um, How's your journey with all this dangerous opportunity and integrating these, these rich, rich practices? Yeah, that's a big question. Hang on one <laughs> second though, Katrina, can you let the doggy in? That's a big um, question. Yeah, big question. Well, we are all human we are all fucking up from time to time without question all the way to all the teachers that you're talking about you know um ramdas used to he had a good phrase for it he would say suddenly to have these you know a dark thought or a something right and he'd look up and he'd go wow how did i get here you know, and then he said he would, he would embrace it, love it, and allow it to dissipate in whichever way. Now, sometimes that dissipation, it's not like it goes away forever. If it's a deep emotion, if somebody's passed that you were close to, and, and then you have these waves that grab you and you are completely lost, right? So it's not like that's going away right away, but... Ramdas, his, his thing was that you uh, you can live on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. So you have, in this case, we're talking about grief. You have grief, but you also have the understanding, even if it's mostly intellectual, which is where the Buddha stuff comes in. So you have some grip you, uh, around what the reality is that around true self and uh, around no self, around emptiness, you know, all of these grand concepts um, that they have that you can go, okay, whoever it was that left, she or he is not, was not that body. That love that we shared, that is continuing no matter what. And uh, a, a, just a bit of an understanding of the evolvement of a, a soul, if you want to call it a soul. I mean, it, all these, Ram Dass always had a lot of fun with the Buddhists. He'd say soul, and then he'd look over like that. You know? <laughs> and they, there's a great film, I think it's going to be up on YouTube, that we did a short film uh, called Moments of Joy and, and uh, Wisdom from Ram Dass in Maui. And there's some of that in there because he works with the Buddhists, and particularly with Joseph, the thing around emptiness and love that's so precious, I can't tell you. So somehow you'll get to me and we'll, we'll get you a URL sure. and all that. But so having, having, um, it's perspective. It's all perspective. You know, once you have trust and that trust leads you to a path, which makes sense, which you, I don't know you and you don't know me. I mean, maybe know of me and everything, but you're just speaking the same thing as me. Right. So you gravitated over to what I gravitated over to and and out of trust. I mean, I, I hear it, you know. So um, that's what everybody needs to uh, have awareness of, that once you have that trust and you get onto a path that makes sense, doesn't matter what it is. They're all the same one way or the other. Obviously, there's a big difference between Gyan Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. And maybe Gyan is a little difficult in, in these very Kali Yugish kind of times, meaning, well, we don't have to, <laughs> we're in it, you know, the environment and, and it's social and political and uh, people have and the have nots or, you know, the haves are such a small part of our world now. Yeah, we are in very difficult times. 
so um, yeah, to once you get that trust and you're on that path, then you start to be a little bit more spacious now, and that only can happen through practice. I mean, you, it's practice. You know what? Practice makes perfect. Well, it, in this case, it makes. Uh, in terms of, for instance, mindfulness and meditation. And yes, Joseph Goldstein, get that book, mindfulness that he wrote. Listen to these podcasts that I did with him on that, uh, on mind rolling, uh, and listen to his own podcast. Um, yeah, you get to that stage where you, you're not jumping at everything. You're not reacting to everything. Uh, in a way that um, precipitates fear, anger, confusion, all of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what's happened to me over these years, is uh, enough spaciousness. So I'm not, first of all, I'm not killing myself about all of the, whatever dark thoughts I'm having or whatever, what the, for me, the killer is this, uh, um, the Tibet, the Tibetan Buddhists call it self-cherishing, and you actually start to see how you are protecting that thing you think you are mm -hmm. in every which way, and motivations and scheming and manipulating and all of it, like whoa, you know, which is what it was kind of like being with Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba when we were physically with him. You know, there it was a clear mirror. So every second you were seeing exactly your selfish tendencies and all of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so what happens is you stop judging yourself the way that you used to. There's a little bit more space around that and uh, a little bit of compassion for being human. You know, so these things set in and then um, you're not bashed around by the waves. You're more surfing. Yeah, that's really just, what's happened. And the um, you got a lot of surfing over there. So. Yeah, that's right. Now the uh, the term you just threw in practice makes perfect because that's a thick trap as well. The perfectionism thing, isn't it? Of like um, this quest for perfectionism, this kind of toxic positivity, which again, which it's one of the main things I appreciate from from this beautiful community is the 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 realness and and you know getting honest and vulnerable with our fuck ups and 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 it's like it feels like that balance of both being honest with it owning it at the same time not not taking it too seriously and that's what i loved about ramdas that's what i love about you this um you know we're all going to fuck up we've all got our karma we're all working with our human experience mm. and yeah. having a little bit a little bit of a sense of humor around that and not taking it so fucking seriously, which is very seductive. It's very, it's a thick trap to, um, on the spiritual path yeah. to try, to try to be like perfect, you know? And, um, yeah. so it's, it's no, very no. refreshing and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. There's no, I mean, practice makes perfect. It's more of a saying. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. it's more about, I mean, it's a very fine line. I mean, because, you know, you can sit around, you know, uh, some of non-dual friends that I have known in the past who are following that path. It's all self-evident. It's happening every moment. You just got to let go into into that happening and you don't need to do anything. There's nothing to do. You know, that's sort of an extreme spiritual bypass, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's the thing of, you know, somebody like, uh, I don't know if you know who Adi Ashanti is, course, he's a, yeah. actually a great non-tool teacher. Mm -hmm. And we talked once and he, he talked about, he was, he was going to go for it because he couldn't get what was going on. That was just, he wasn't happy. And he was meditating 20 hours a day or some crazy shit. And then uh, he said at one point, he decided this isn't working. This is stupid. And he stopped after years. And as soon as he stopped, he had a, you know, profound experience, uh, a very enlightening, profound experience. And so, how, you know, navigating that is, uh, and Joseph Goldstein talks a lot about that too. 
It's called right effort in the Eightfold Path. And getting that straight is, you, you sort of got to forget about yourself mm-hmm. the way you do when you go brush your teeth. And you just sit, you know, eh, see what happens kind of thing, you know. And for me, you know, I the Hanuman Chalisa, are you, you know the Hanuman Chalisa? Of course, yeah. What, well, I don't, I don't yeah. know it. I don't know it fully, but I'm in the, I'm in the process. <laughs> okay, you better do it or you won't get enlightened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you know what uh, lightened that trip, actually? It was one, one day at Ram Dass's house. We were doing, it was a small kirtan. And um, I, was, I was singing it along with the notes in front of me, mm. along with my wife. And, um, and we looked over to him and he was like, I don't know it either. <laughs> he whispered to <laughs> us, he, did, he didn't know it either. And he was just uh, opening his mouth. I think he did know it, but... Um, uh, nah, another, uh, I don't uh, think he did. <laughs> right. I think he knew parts of it. I th- Which... Made us fall Sorry. in love with him even more, you know, because we yeah. would have assumed great Baba yeah. Ramdas right. knew it perfectly. But the... <laughs> yeah, really. no, even Maharaji said, if you learn the Chalisa, your brother will be okay. He had a crazy brother. I mean, mentally deranged brother. Mm-hmm. And he never did. So and we, I never talked yeah. to him about it, but, you know, okay. uh, he knew it mostly, but he didn't know it completely. And uh, yeah, he would have laughed about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we wrap this up, it'd be nice to bring a bit of attention to the, the conversation on, on Guru. Because of course, you've had profound experiences being around Maharaji. And it, it's become an interesting perception for younger practitioners uh, of course with a lot of the you know sex scandals and and power trips and whatnot um so it's a confusing word a confusing concept for a lot of younger practitioners about the guru Mm. for better or for worse and um it's good that all this stuff's coming up and you know wounds are getting healed and you know we're having the conversations but what to do with the the guru phenomena like um it's been profound even just uh, i of course i never met maharaji but i i feel i feel him i feel it uh through you all through the mystery and um i i feel like a, a kind of middle middle way type perception of hearing this predicament of the common traps of the guru mentality when one you know, is either claiming to be a guru or, or um, people are claiming that they're guru, but they, they're not fully in that guru state. It, it, it's, a, it's a slippery slope or it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky power trip. Um, yeah. So, sure is. And I've heard you brought up Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, talk on the new guru being Sangha which uh, I, I dig, I get it, I feel that. And um, let's talk about a bit about that. How are you feeling about the guru phenomena and potentially this new thought of Sangha? <laughs> oh, that's a bunch of bullshit, that Sangha thing. <laughs> right. I'm going to get roasted. Of course, I believe <laughs> every word Thich Nhat Hanh said. The, you know, the coming Maitreya is the Sangha, you know, and that's all true, too. But as Ramda said, and as we know, everyone has an inner guru that doesn't need necessarily to manifest physically. And in Maharaji's case, he's got, you know, thousands of people that are connected to him the same way we are without having a body. So that's not, you know, it's not necessary, but everyone does have it. I mean, you can just start with intuition, you know, being connected with a deep part of yourself. That's not your thinking mind. So Ram Dass used to call, he used to say, I, I have a room in my mind. It's called imagination. And that's where I hang out with Maharaji. Mm. In other words, you take a step to open up a door that's beyond rational mind. Mm. 
basically that's all he's talking about. As far as the gurus, especially in the West, and I include you know, around the world, really. I mean, India has a, a gazillion gurus that are not gurus, because if you interpret it in in its most classical sense, it's sat every you know there's there's your flower guru around the corner. He's got the best flowers, right? I mean, it's a word that's gone basically. But if you use the traditional Indian thing, which is Indian and Tibetan Buddhist sat guru, the true guru. So that is somebody who's no longer in any subjective, objective polarization inside themselves. Nothing. They just are living in a pool and all, they're in generally in India called siddhas. And there's very, not a lot of, you know, I mean, my uh, mentor, K.K. Shah, used to say there's like one siddha per 100,000 saints, for instance. So it's a, it is a rare thing, apparently, to live in a body and, and not have that duality. All the, Maharaji had a personality. I mean, he uh, the way that he played with us, you know, these kids from the West, I mean, he had a great time with us, you know, making, like, singing, and we were doing all this stuff, and eating and feeding, and it was, like, had nothing to do with, there was no Dharma talks, nothing. There was no... And he didn't care. He didn't say go meditate. We just happened to go off and met Joseph and and Sharon and 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 started meditating, you know, using vipassana. Now it's a foundational practice for many many of us. You know, I have held on to it all these years. You know, so, but a teacher is more appropriate, and a teacher is someone who points the way. He is not the way. So. And if, if, unfortunately, people get involved with teachers that are proclaiming to be gurus or enlightened and abuse happens and so on, um, this is just tough karma. Somebody needed to go through through this and hopefully come out the other side, which many people do. Some people don't. And it just turns them off. And I have no idea how how it all works, but it's it's real. We, you and I, both know tons of people that this has happened to one way or the other. There's a, you know, this crazy ne- is it Nexium? This thing I saw a few episodes on uh, Netflix. So oh, Jesus, God, man. it's saying all the right things, you know, in the beginning. This crazy guy, and then complete control and abuse. I mean, it was just off off the wall. So hopefully, you know, I mean, I'm saying hopefully people can wake up when they start to see. It's not even seeing. It's just feeling. It just doesn't feel right. Like with you, you're like feeling this stuff and it feels right, you know, which mm-hmm. is the same as me. And, uh, and I just, I look back and I, I think, wow, that was pretty fortunate. Set up a whole life like the, the way it was. I guess and, that's part uh, of the trickiness of it is like when I look back to more destructive times, like, uh, you know, like, for example, when I was a teenager taking way too many drugs, uh, teenagers should. And um, that felt right on at the time. I was loving it. You know, yeah. so, so it's tricky, like how, how our delusion and our karma, like what can feel right is just kind of what we've got to, what we've got to go through, even if it's shit. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, so that's yeah. where it gets kind and of mysterious. You, wasn't that shit. you had a good time, right? Well, I had a good time. It nearly killed me, but it also oh. <laughs> woke, woke me up to better ways to, um, yeah. to expand my consciousness and all yeah. that. So it, it, got, it got me curious as to other ways and mm. brought in a bit more reverence for, for the body and for life and but it, it was both destructive and awakening that kind of yeah well, yeah. well be. and when you get down to it you know suffering this is something that was repeated all the time when we were in india suffering brings me closer to god and so usually we do not wake up without some suffering right i mean uh now 
I was suffering when I was a, a, a kid before um, meeting up with Eastern stuff because nothing made sense. Thank God for Bob Dylan. That's all I got to tell you. <laughs> At least I knew there was other people like me out there. And John Coltrane, right? Uh, and got... John Coltrane. Well, that was that was mystical though. With mm -hmm. with Dylan, it was like I felt okay. I'm okay. I'm not the only one. I'm not this, right. you know singular solo individual blah blah so that at least started that and with coltrane it was an actual out-of-body mystical experience you know being with him and listening to him play wow. um yeah but uh, you know finally when i got to the east shall we say came to me uh i just felt so fortunate to find a framework that made sense. So, you know, I had been suffering and then I understood that I, I needed to take all experiences and have them work for me in transformation, not so much intellectually, but experientially. And what helped with that? Psychedelics, right? I mean, that really helped with that. It helped with even understanding someone like Neem Karoli Baba, and, and I don't understand anything. What I mean is it helped me to be in that presence without freaking out, okay? Because it was like an acid trip, being in that unconditionality that's moment, I mean, it doesn't end, you know, it just doesn't end. So back to the guru thing, though, with all of the you know the kinds of things that people get involved with that are very hurtful by getting on a trip with somebody who is interested in self gratification if that's happening then it's you know it it becomes really a tough tough issue and i would just say the only beings that you can trust in in the sense of what a guru trust quote unquote means is somebody that is not got anything going on for themselves so there's and and you someone go well how do you know that oh shit it's just instant i sat down you called it actually Stuart. you you said you called a him and an it i think you used the word it because what what is it you know mm -hmm. it's way beyond a human in a blanket you know it's that thing that is part of the the uh, interconnectivity of joy and love and wisdom that just permeates the universe and that's that uh, divine intelligence you know there's so many words for it. but um unless that's there you will know it and and it is rare it's it's uh the tibetans have had more of these kinds of beings in the last 100 years i think than than the Indians for some reason, and maybe I'm just a projected bias. I have no idea, but yeah, I know 16th Karmapa. Absolutely. When I got in, just close enough to him, I could feel him. It was just the same as Neem Karoli Baba. I mean, same thing. There was, and I knew it was an it. That's a good thing. It, it's just an <laughs> it. That it does the right thing for you and everybody else. It is not interested in anything for itself. It's only here for whoever gathers around it. And that's hard to come by. Uh, and, and lots of people proclaim themselves to be this. And unfortunately, some people get wrapped up in it. And it's like you, yeah, it's like you went through what you had to go through when you were a kid with drugs and, and you fortunately came out of it okay. Some of us do and some of us don't. And that's a mystery. That's part of the mystery of like our, if you, of course, the acceptance of karma and reincarnation is elemental to understanding that we aren't this body that dies and that's the end of it. So that's how the East has informed us and helped us out, Eastern philosophy. So uh, you got to get into a trust like if I'm living, what city are you in? In Perth, Western Australia. You're in Perth. Oh, so as if I'm far, in Perth, as far as you, as far as one can get from you, probably nearly. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, one of these days, I want to I want to come there. But uh, 
yeah, if I'm in Perth and I'm somebody who's interested in yoga and saw you, it's a possibility. And uh, trust your intuition when you get with that teacher. That it's not going to be necessarily someone that is the way, but can help point the way. And if it has, if the teacher has any kind of opening to um, not being a person who is interested in self-gratification through teaching and all of that, what that implies, then just, boy, grab onto that trust. Because mm-hmm. that person, if he, really, he or she really cares, is most likely going to be opening you up to um, the right resources whether in this case you're doing it now in in are you doing things live right now physically yeah yeah luckily wow. we've been able to gather in in person in community and we, wow. we i think right now we literally don't have one covid case on record and that's been in that Perth? way for a little yeah because it's a unique place yeah. it's it's quite unique when you when you look at how big australia is and then Perth is all the way over the West Coast. And uh, I mean, it's a city of a couple million people, but um, it's, it's quite, we're in summer, it's quite sunny. A lot, of people, uh, a lot of people haven't been going to indoors like workplaces much. And, um, and Australia just shut borders really fucking quick and got, yeah. it under, got it under control. And so we've been able to go to classes and teach. We had like, probably a month where we didn't, where we couldn't, um, no, nah, maybe two mm-hmm. months. And, um, mm. and that kind of got it under control here, but um, yeah. definitely not taking it for granted because borders are opening up more and things are yeah. changing yeah. and, yeah. Um, and who, who knows what the year ahead will lay out, but um, grateful that uh, we've actually been able to gather. And, and yeah, it, that, well, that's terrific. Cause that's, uh, you know, people are really, missing that here you know we do through love server member foundation ramdas.org and the be here now podcast network we do as much stuff online as as we can Mm -hmm. uh and a lot of people are doing it uh christian das included who's part of the family and uh but again these people are coming to you and it's fantastic that you can actually be together that way at this point seems crazy to us uh, you know uh yeah, and people are going and deep, so- you know. People are uh, really feeling the collective angst and I think realizing how good we've got it. And I can feel like pe- people are going deep right now, you know. Um, it's, been, mm. it's, it's been beautiful in that regard, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but it's obvious that uh, this is the point to the whole discussion around, uh, you know, dangerous opportunity and gurus uh, that, trust is the big element that runs through all of this and Mm -hmm. someone like you they're going to go there i'm they're going to engender this trust will be engendered and and then these resources will be laid out yeah that you love and you want to shut so that's that's most fun for me is sharing stuff i love you know i don't really and it's not about getting enlightened it's about getting a little bit more kind and compassionate and Spread a little, as Ram Dass said, radiate that love, you know, soul to soul to soul. That's what it's about. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's that natural progression through trust is what, it's, to me, is the, is the biggest yeah, uh, well, step anybody can take. Sure. Raghu, let's wrap this up. Uh, totally okay. honor, honor your time. I'd love to hear you talk for hours, but uh, people that are new to Raghu Marcus's work, um, head to his podcast, Mind Rolling Podcast. It's amazing. And check out all the other Be Here Now podcasts. Yeah, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and what, else, uh, what else would you like to let everyone know about this uh, latest Ram Dass book? I'm excited to receive it and dive oh, in. That just came out, yeah. yeah. Being Ram Dass. Go to BeingRamdas.com and you'll see You'll be able to read excerpts. You'll see a bunch of really cool pictures. You can order the book. You can make your own comments about whatever he might have meant to you. So it's a great site, beingramdas.com. Definitely go visit that. Definitely go to beherenownetwork.com. 
Definitely get Joseph Goldstein's book, Mindfulness, okay? And you can get that in the Ramda shop, perhaps. Uh, I mean, we're just doing so many things as much as we can to share what Ramdas has always shared all these years until a year ago and change. And uh, we are just happy that uh, people uh, are gravitating towards what he really represents. I mean, we're going to do a, a, a major course, online course, uh, and I'll let you, you know, you'll, you'll know about it, I know, because you're helping us out, but uh, it'll be the life and teachings of Ramdas and the practice of being here now. And uh, those are the kinds of things that can really help because he is so great at giving the fundamentals of perspective and being kind to yourself. And he he was honest. He was just honest all the time, you know. So we're going to have that. We've got more music series. We've got our Soul Land music series that we do, live streaming of great stuff between Trevor Hall and Krishna Das and more. So, yeah. Just uh, go to uh, go to ramdas.org and put your email address in, and then you'll get all the kinds of notifications telling you what we're up to and turning Beautiful. you on to different things. Yeah. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much, Raghu. Great to connect. Ram Ram. Yes. Ram Ram. <laughs>